Thank you to our choir for the Ministry of Music. I can't help but thinking, I love the old Andy Griffith show, and as I'm listening to you sing in the beautiful music, I'm thinking, that was extra good. Thank you. Praise be to God, and thanks to Faith for a wonderful children's sermon. She's a vision, isn't she? So, <laughs> you know, I want to talk about courage this morning. I want to talk about Christian courage. Um, as I was listening to the words of the anthem, saying, here, here am I, Lord. Um, when we offer ourselves to God, we offer ourselves not knowing where God will call, how he will call, what situations he will put us in. And often, um, those situations can require us to step up and lean on him for courage. And I wonder if you remember a time when you might have exhibited courage or been particularly courageous in your life. I mean, not everybody, you know, has thrown themselves on a grenade or done something you know, that is just out of this world. But there are ways in which we live, uh, our daily ways, that we, we routinely exhibit courage. But uh, I remember I was about 14 or 15. Uh, my parents divorced, and uh, it was just my mother and my three younger brothers and I. And we were coming home one night. We lived in New York, and we're coming home, and we, it was dark. And we drove up to the house, and we saw the door, the front door to our house, wide open. Now, I don't mean it was unlocked, it, it was no screen, it was just open, like anybody could have been in there, raccoons could have walked in, any, anything. And uh, it was kind of frightening there, because, you know, it is New York, it's, you know, a little bit different, you've got to watch your back, and, um, and it was scary, and so um, we didn't know what else to do, so I'm, like I said, I'm about 14 or 15, my other brother's a year younger than me, and we told our mom to wait in the car with our younger brothers, and he and I said, we're going to go check out the house, and we had to go through every room, every closet, and make sure nobody was in there. And let me tell you, that's not something I wanted to do. I'd have been happy if we just sold the house right then and there and moved somewhere else. But we were the, to use the term loosely, we were the men of the house, and it was our job. And it kind of reminds me, sometimes courage means not doing things that, you know, that doesn't mean we're not afraid, but we do those things anyway. And there's a beautiful story in Scripture about courage uh, from a couple of unlikely people, a couple of people you've ne- maybe never meditated on before, but they show us the meaning of courage and what courage means in our lives as followers of Jesus Christ. I want to invite you to turn with me to the book of Exodus, uh, chapter 1. And this follows immediately, the passage follows immediately on the story of Joseph. You remember we did a series on Joseph earlier in the year, Joseph, the son of Jacob, sold into slavery in Egypt, uh, rose by God's grace and power to great prominence, um, by God's grace saved the Egyptians in the area from a devastating famine, and then Joseph and his brothers reunited and um, they lived out their lives in Egypt, and God prospered his people in Egypt. We pick up now in our scripture passage Sometime later, it doesn't say how long later. We know the Egyptians, uh, the Israelites were in Egypt for 430 years. But we pick up at a time, maybe decades later, 100 years later, we're not quite sure, when the Israelites have just grown and grown and grown, and and it's starting to worry the Egyptian uh, government. So beginning in verse 6 of chapter 1 of Exodus, friends, hear the word of the Lord. The scripture says, Now Joseph and all his brothers and all that generation died. But the Israelites were fruitful and multiplied greatly and became exceedingly numerous so that the land was filled with them. Then a new king, who did not know about Joseph, came to power in Egypt. Look, he said to his people, the Israelites have become much too numerous for us. Come, we must deal shrewdly with them or they will become even more numerous. And if war breaks out, we'll join our enemies, fight against us, and leave the country." So they put slave masters over them to oppress them with forced labor, and they built Python and Ramesses as store cities for Pharaoh. But the more they were oppressed, the more they multiplied and spread. So the Egyptians came to dread the Israelites and worked them ruthlessly. They made their lives bitter with hard labor in brick and mortar and with all kinds of work in the fields. In all their hard labor, the Egyptians used them ruthlessly. The king of Egypt said to the Hebrew midwives, whose names were Shifra and Puah, when you help the Hebrew women in childbirth and observe them on the delivery stool, if it is a boy, kill him. But if it is a girl, let her live. The midwives, however, feared God and did not do what the king of Egypt had told them to do. They let the boys live. 
Then the king of Egypt summoned the midwives and asked them, Why have you done this? Why have you let the boys live? The midwives answered Pharaoh, Hebrew women are not like Egyptian women. They are vigorous and give birth before the midwives arrive. So God was kind to the midwives, and the people increased and became even more numerous. And because the midwives fear God, he gave them families of their own. Friends, this is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Would you pray with me? Father God, we thank you for your holy word. We thank you for the living word, our Lord Jesus Christ. And we pray now, Lord, that the words of my mouth and meditations of all our hearts would be pure and acceptable in your sight, our Lord, our rock, and our redeemer. In Jesus' holy name we pray and give thanks. Amen. A man, um, man walks up to the pearly gates, and when he gets there, St. Peter opens up a big book, and he, he begins leafing through the pages looking for some reason why he should let the man in. And so St. Peter looks for several minutes, he turns the pages back and forth, and then furrowing his brow, St. Peter finally looks up and says to the man, you know, you know, I can't see that you ever really did anything good in your life, but then again, you never did anything really bad either. So I'll tell you what, Peter says, if you can tell me one really good deed you did in your life, you're in. Of course, we know that's not good theology, but just play along. And so the man thinks about it for a moment. He says, well, he goes, there was this one time I was driving down the highway and saw a mean biker gang harassing this poor old lady. So I slowed down my car to see what was going on, and sure enough, there they were, about 50 of them hassling her. Infuriated, I got out of my car, grabbed a tire iron from the trunk, and I walked over to the leader of the gang, a huge guy, with a studded leather jacket, a chain running from his nose to his ear, and a snake for a belt. As I confronted the leader, the rest of the gang formed a circle around me. And so I ripped the chain off the leader's face. I poked him in the chest. And I yelled out to him and all to the rest of them. I said, you're all a bunch of sick, deranged animals. You better leave this poor old lady alone and get out of here before I teach you all a new lesson in pain. Well, St. Peter was certainly impressed. And so he said to the man, wow, that is amazing. When did this all happen? And the man said, oh, about two minutes ago. Now, you can define courage a lot of ways, although I don't necessarily recommend defining it like that. But, you know, courage is one of those virtues we don't really think about until we're called to exercise it in some way or another. But I like what Bill Bennett said in his book of Common Virtues. Bennett said, the brave person is not the one who's never afraid. Rather, courage is about acting bravely, even when we don't really feel brave. For example... You've probably heard now in the news about the three Americans and and the the Britain who helped thwart a terrorist attack Friday aboard a train traveling between Amsterdam and Paris. It's an amazing story. These guys are just sitting on the train minding their own business when they hear a gunshot and see a train employee run past them followed by a gunman brandishing an automatic weapon. Now, you know, I got to think that if you're a passenger on that train in that situation, you know, i got to imagine your first instincts would be to run the other way. To get as far away from the guy with the gun as possible. But while train employees quickly lock themselves behind closed doors, these guys, just passengers, mind you, sprang into action. They tackled the gunman, disarmed him, and subdued him for the authorities. How many lives did they save? We'll never know. But they were immediately hailed as heroes and lauded for their incredible courage, as they should be. But that doesn't mean they they weren't afraid. I mean, how, how can you not be afraid when you're wrestling with a guy with an automatic weapon? So courage isn't about never being afraid. Courage is doing what's right even when we are afraid. And, you know, when we think about all the examples in the Bible of courage, we, you know, we think of things maybe like David facing down Goliath, Moses confronting Pharaoh. 
We might think of the Apostle Paul standing up for the gospel and being beaten and stoned and run out of one town after another after another. Even Jesus praying in the Garden of Gethsemane, knowing the cross was just ahead. I mean, that's courage. But honestly, when we think of courage, does anybody ever think of Shifra and Pua? Or for that matter, does anybody even know who they are? The fact is, these are probably two of the most anonymous and underappreciated women you'll ever find in the Bible. They're the Rodney Dangerfields of Scripture. They get no respect. I mean, you won't find any documentaries about their lives. Chances are you won't hear many sermons about them. And except for this one time in Exodus, they're never mentioned again. And yet, without the remarkable courage, there wouldn't have even have been an Exodus So who were they? Well, as I said before, their story comes on the heels of Joseph and his brother's generation. They they died off, and and the Israelites began multiplying greatly in Egypt. And this growing demographic begins to worry a new Egyptian king who who doesn't remember Joseph, and and he certainly doesn't know about everything Joseph did for Egypt. All he knows is that the Hebrews are growing more and more numerous, and he sees it as a threat to Egyptian sovereignty and security. And so he decides to do something about it by enslaving the Israelites and working them so ruthlessly, hoping to wear them down. But when that doesn't work and the Israelites continue to multiply, Pharaoh comes up with an even more sinister plan of having all the Hebrew baby boys quietly killed at birth. But of course, to do this, he needed the cooperation of these two Hebrew midwives, Shifra and Puah. So who were these women? Well, the scriptures tell us almost nothing about them. It, it refers to them as the Hebrew midwives, but it's unlikely they were the only midwives servicing the Hebrew community. It would have been impossible. Scholars estimated at the time the number of Hebrews might have been as high as 2 million people living in Egypt. So it just couldn't have been the two of them. What's more likely is Shifra and Pua were the chief midwives. In other words, they're the ones in charge. And as the ones in charge, Shifra and Pua were in a unique position to influence all the other midwives under them. That's why Pharaoh summons them. You see, if Pharaoh could get them to cooperate, it would be the most subtle way of carrying out his deadly plan. After all, infant mortality rates were high. Half of all children didn't even make it to age five. It would be a long time before anybody ever caught on, and by then, Pharaoh could have wiped out an entire generation. But of course, his plan depended on their quiet complicity. Not that Shifra and Pua are in any position to argue, mind you. They, they were just lowly Hebrew slaves. But obviously, the fewer people who knew about it, the better. But it does bring up the question for us, What are we willing to do when nobody else is looking? What are we willing to do when the pressure's on and the spotlight's off? Back in the late 70s, the Citicorp building was built and instantly became one of the most unique features in the New York City skyline. See it up there? I'm sure you've seen that building before. At over 900 feet, it was the seventh tallest building in the world when it was built. And its slash top roof at that 45 degree angle gives it this really distinctive, really cool look. But shortly after it was built, the building's structural engineer consultant, a man named William Levesar, became aware of a potentially fatal problem in its construction. Now, you know, I read about it, several accounts, all the intricacies of the engineering are, are beyond me, but as I understand it, the way in which the building was designed left it susceptible to hurricane force winds hitting it at a 45 degree angle. The safety protocols were built in, of course, but a last minute decision to bolt interior joints rather than weld them, which was the original plan, they weren't properly recalculated in estimating the building's structural integrity and strength, and it left the Citicorp building vulnerable. Now, according to Lemezer's research, the odds, the odds of just enough wind hitting the Citicorp building at just the right angle, uh, those odds weren't very high. Besides, the building had an internal dampening system to, to compensate for high winds, but 
he learned, according to his calculations, if just enough wind blew in, and if it hit the building at just the right angle, and if the internal dampening system just happened to be offline, it could lead to catastrophic failure and collapse. Of course, the chances of such a thing happening were remote at best. And so Lemezar might have just kept quiet about the whole thing. After all, he was the only one who knew. But I also know he was the one who was responsible. And so Lemezar, and, and you've got to put yourself in a situation here, he put his own reputation on the line, he put his own career on the line, as well as the reputation of his firm, and he went to Citicorp explaining the problem that he helped create it was his problem. And he proposed a solution that would end up costing millions. Of course, by blowing the whistle, he might have been ruined professionally, firms sued, and for something that was at best only theoretical under certain conditions. But he went anyway. And to their credit, Citicorp got right on it, and within months, fixed the problem, and the Mezar's reputation was actually enhanced and is often cited now as a model of business ethics. You see, the point of it all is what are you willing to do when nobody else is looking? What are you willing to do when you're the only one who knows? That's the true test of character and courage. That's the test of what we really believe. And this question of character... This question of courage is what Shifra and Pua have to wrestle with. I mean, they've got every reason in the world just to go quietly along with Pharaoh's plans. He's the king, the most powerful man in the world, and they were nobodies. Their lives were at stake. And yet the Bible says the midwives, however, feared God and did not do what the king of Egypt had told them to do. They let the boys live, you see. These were women of courage. They were women of conviction and character. And they disobeyed a direct order from the king because in the end it wasn't Pharaoh they were afraid of so much as they feared God. The fact that they knew that there's a God in heaven, a God to whom we all must one day give an account of our lives, gave them the courage to do what was right in spite of enormous pressure to do otherwise. But you know, I want to be careful here today. I want to be careful and not to confuse what they did for what so often gets passed off as courage nowadays. You know, I don't, I don't know about you, but, you know, I get tired of hearing the word courage thrown around for every celebrity or athlete or politician who somehow messes up their lives and then has to come clean about it. That's not courage. That's simply getting caught and doing damage control. You see, doing what you have to do when you've run out of options doesn't necessarily make you courageous. It's doing what you don't have to do when you've got options for doing something else and you still choose to do the right thing. That's what courage is about. Like those three Americans and that one Briton on the train last Friday, like a woman who once refused to move to the back of the bus when she was told to. I know some of you remember December 1st, 1955, when a woman named Rosa Parks was ordered to give up her seat on a Montgomery, Alabama city bus to a white passenger and for her to move to the back. But Mrs. Parks refused. Now, the popular version of the story says that Rosa Parks well, she was just an old woman with tired feet, too weary to get up after a hard day's work, but the popular version is wrong. Rosa Parks wasn't an old woman. She was 42. And as one author put it, it wasn't her feet that were tired. Her sense of justice was tired. She was tired of being pushed around and, and not treated like a human being, and she decided to do something about it. See, it often gets lost in the stories. We don't know that there were three others on the bus that day ordered to give up their seats, and all three complied. Only Mrs. Parks had the courage to say no when no needed to be said. 
Bill Bennett says, Rosa Parks' refusal to move to the back of the bus marked a historic moment, the start of a movement that would bring an end to the tradition of legal segregation across the South and the entire nation. He says, Parks certainly never expected her gesture would turn a new page in the history of American race relations. She didn't move, she later explained, because she was suddenly fed up with being pushed around, but the courage of the movement sparked the fires of change. Now you think about it, the easy thing, of course, the easy thing would have been for Rosa Parks just to move when the driver told her to move. That would have been the easy thing. Just as the easy thing would have been for the Hebrew midwives to simply go ahead and quietly cooperate with Pharaoh. I mean, for that matter, the easy thing would have been for Jesus just to forget about the cross and forget about us. But the easy thing is seldom the right thing. And the right thing is seldom easy. Real courage is doing the right thing regardless of the cost or the consequences. But how do we know what the right thing is? Well, these two women give us a clue. The Bible says the midwives, however, feared God and did not do what the king of Egypt had told them to do. They let the boys live. They knew what was right because they feared God. Scriptures tell us that the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom and knowledge of the Holy One is understanding. But what does it mean to fear God? You see, nowadays in our pop culture religion, uh, we just like to focus on God's love and His mercy and His grace. And, and, you know, we should focus on those things because that's who God is. But He's also holy. He's also just. He's also perfect. He's also omnipotent. And the one to whom we owe our complete obedience In fact, just this morning I was reading in my Bible during devotionals where Jesus said, if you love me, you will obey what I command. And Jesus says this repeatedly. So to fear God means to give God his due, to respect who he is and his claim in our lives. To fear God means to love the things God loves, to hate the things God hates, and to live with the fundamental conviction of God's love as well as as his authority in our lives, knowing that one day, that you and I, that we will all stand before his throne and give an account of ourselves to him. That's what the fear of the Lord means. And that's where we find true courage. Early in the 5th century AD, there was a monk named Timelicus who lived in what's now present-day Turkey. And at the time Timelicus lived, The gladiator games are still popular in the Roman Empire, and thousands, of course, would crowd into the Colosseum and other places and and watch slaves and prisoners fight it out to the death for their amusement. One day, Timelicus felt the Holy Spirit kind of compelling him that he needed for some reason to go to Rome. And when he got there, he got swept along one day with a crowd as they made their way into the Colosseum. And once inside, he was horrified to actually witness what was happening. There were men fighting to the death and and the spectators being whipped to a frenzy by the bloodshed and he he felt he had to do something. And so Timelicus ran down the steps of the Colosseum. He jumped down inside onto the arena floor where the gladiators were fighting. He began running forth between them as they're fighting, screaming, Stop! Stop! In the name of Christ! I beg you, stop! Well, you imagine the scene at first, the crowds, they were amused. See this little monk scurrying around the arena between the gladiators as they fought? It had to be a sight. But then they heard and they began to realize what Timelicus was saying and their mood quickly soured. And from their seats, they began rushing toward the arena floor, began hurling stones at Timelicus until he eventually lay dead on the Colosseum floor. And popular legend says that when the crowd saw him lying there, this little monk They had a change of heart and began filing out one by one. Now, whether that's true or not, how they reacted, I don't know. But according to historians, when the emperor had heard what had happened, he issued an imperial edict right then and there, abolishing the gladiatorial games forever. All because one man had the courage to do what was right. Now, you may never face anything as dramatic in your own life. You may never find yourselves in the position Shifra and Puah found themselves in. 
Then again, you might. We live in a crazy world, a world that's getting crazier all the time. You know, I know people don't want to talk about this, but you cannot see things on the news like the gruesome practices of Planned Parenthood and not be moved by it. You cannot sit idly by and say stuff like that is not the business of the church. It most certainly is. That and so much more. And in some way, in some form, at some time, the pressure is going to be on and you're going to have to say no when no needs to be said and to stand up and be counted while everybody else is sitting down. It isn't easy, and I'm not saying you won't be scared or I won't be scared, or that there might not even be consequences. But remember, courage isn't about whether or not you're afraid. We're all afraid at some time or another. Rather, courage, real courage, is about doing what's right, even when doing what's right is hard, and even when you don't have to do it. I mean, isn't that what Jesus did for us on the cross? Think about the courage that Jesus displayed on the cross. Those were in his sins that he bore. Those were in his sins he died for. Those were in his burdens. They were ours. Jesus certainly didn't have to do what he did when he stretched out his arms on the cross and said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. But he did it because of his love for us. And he calls us now, in our day, in our age, to be courageous for him by remembering the cross. By remembering that the cross is where ultimate courage was revealed And remembering that the cross is where our own courage is born. Would you pray with me? Father God, we thank you for Jesus Christ, your Son, Lord. And of all the attributes, Lord, we think about you, merciful, holy, just, loving. Lord, we often don't throw the word courageous in there. And yet, Lord, that is what you are. Lord Jesus, you came when you didn't have to. You took burdens that weren't yours. You carried sins and our infirmities. You suffered for us, Lord, when you didn't have to. You showed us what true courage and true love is all about, Lord. And Lord, as your people, Lord, you call us to obey what you command, to live in faith, Lord, to live... With the knowledge, Lord, you love us, you forgive us when we fall, you pick us up, Lord, but you also call us to be courageous, to be salt and light in the world, in our churches, in our homes, in our workplaces, wherever you have us to be, Lord. And Lord, sometimes it's hard, we don't know what to do, we're we're caught off guard. We, We think about the response only after it happened when we needed to do it then, Lord, but We admit, Lord, our weaknesses, and and we pray, Lord, for your spirit to embolden us. Give us courageous hearts for the gospel, for living the gospel, for doing what's right, Lord, for being people of the light. And We pray your spirit would be upon us, Lord, that we may give good witness to you. Father God, we do pray for this church, for its witness in this community and the world. We pray for your people in this church. Lord, remembering Judith Riding's family, Lord, Susan and Spencer and their family today. Comfort them as they grieve, Lord. We remember Pam Mason and pray for Pam's encouragement, Lord, your spirit upon her. Lord, for Karen Dixon for healing after surgery, Lord, and your blessing upon Karen and Dean. We pray for Ed Bowen, Lord, and we pray for those, Lord, who are recovering from surgeries, and even now, Lord, those who are dealing with things deeply in their hearts, Lord, that only you know about. Minister to the Lord, to all of us at our deepest needs, and help us to follow you with our whole heart. And Lord, we want to just thank you and praise you and lift our voices as one people today as we pray in the way Christ our Savior taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread 
and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Friends, I'd like to invite you to stand as we sing our second hymn this morning, The Wonderful Cross.